Welcome to Wired on the Word, the Bible Society of South Africa's official podcast. Hello again and welcome to our podcast, Wired on the Word. You're with your host, Leon Steenkamp. And uh, today I'm joined by my colleagues from the Marketing and Communications Department, uh, Nicholas Lamour. Hello, Nicholas. Hello. And uh, Hanu Kutsia. Hello there. Welcome, guys. And then our very special guest this morning is the uh, head of the translation department of the Bible Society of South Africa, Dr. Masanyani Beloy. Welcome, Masanyani. Hello. So um, today is the topic, as you know, this podcast is all about uh, the Bible, Bible translation and all things Bible related. And uh, we're going to be speaking about um, Bible translation, the the art, the science of it, and um, how we at the Bible Society, and I'm guessing uh, Bible translation agencies across the world, go about translating this very um, sacred and often difficult text, uh, given the, the time it was written in, the cultural changes, all things, things like that. Masunyani, when does the Bible Society decide to translate a Bible? What, what, how does that process uh, kick off? The Bible Society does not start a Bible translation unless it's asked by the churches and the community which is using that specific language. So if they have got a written doc, uh, letters or written documents from the community needing the Bible to be translated into their own language, then the Bible Society receives the letter, takes the letters to the board, and then the board approves the translation, and then the translation can start. You don't just go and get people on the street and you say, come and translate. No. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. The people who have written the letters have to identify the people they want to translate the Bible. So when they come, I go as a translation consultant or as a head of the Bible translation. Then I take these people, I said, okay, we will make sure that all the stakeholders are represented. The churches which have applied for the, for the Bible, ask for the Bible, then we start. Okay, these are the 15 people or 12 people you have given me. Whom do you want to be translators? They will say this one and that one and that one. Then I said, okay, all of you must give me your CVs. And then I go through the CVs. Some of them don't even have good CVs, but they, they want to be translators. And people, most, in most cases, they think it's so simple to translate. Yeah, when they, in, in, in most churches in the African context, you will find a preacher preaching and another one in translating. Now they think when they come to the Bible, they can do that. And another tricky thing with this, because this one is nepotism, because this one is related to me and then he's going to get something and I, need, I don't need to be giving him money or anything else. If he's working, doing the translation, then you can take care of himself mm. or herself. Then they bring these people to you. Mm. And then what I do, after receiving the CVs, I look through the CVs, and I cannot say because you did not pass grade 12 or whatever, and you have been brought by the church, go back. Mm. No. <clears throat> now I have to try to find a way without estranging the Bible Society from the community. Mm -hmm. Then I say, I give you Genesis to translate, to draft. And then give, let's take three or four of them, those who are aspiring to be translators. Each one gets a book mm -hmm. to go and translate. What is expected of those people? I sit down with them. This is what you are supposed to do you draft this translation from the source text. We have got an interlinear in the soft text. The soft uh, software is paratext. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you are doing oral translation, then you have got the render. It's a software. <coughs> yeah, and, and then 
they will start translating and then I show them this is how you work around this Hebrew or this Greek. So when you have drafted it uh, within the UBS society, we call it stage one. And then when you edit your work, we call it stage two. Okay. Now, as we are four here, then we come together. Let's for argument say you've translated Genesis. All of us check whether your Genesis is a true reflection of the source text and whether it flows. Mm. Then we read it aloud. Hebrew and for argument say English. It's the word order is not the same. So when you translate word for word, then the English will be funny because Hebrew is so it's funny. Mm. So and then from there you you prepare that you disagree on terminology until you have agreed. And then myself as a translation consultant, then I look into that. Because when you do send and receive in paratext from your home, I'm going to receive that in paratext. It comes to my screen. It's just like a WhatsApp or an SMS. Yeah, but you do it by send and receive. Then it comes through to me. Then I look at it. And then I said, okay, I'm satisfied with this, but this is not a true reflection of what is in the Hebrew. Then I make notes inside paratext software this text is meaning this but what you have written here it's 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 uh, it's appear to be meaning this mm. yeah and then when we have agreed the translators and the translation consultant then we take it to the review committee so we have finished stage 3 now we are taking it to stage 4 some uh, organization call it uh, community testing. Why do they call this stage four community testing? It's because you must get this man who speaks Africans, Hrikwa Africans. You get that one who speaks the Orange River Africans. And you get this one from the Bokap who speaks Caps. And you take another one from the Transvaal who speaks a different Africans. You put them together. We call them, those things dialects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they tell you, no, we're going to use one dialect, you know how you're going to find out that they are not using the one dialect. When you come to a certain term, a word, or terminology or a mm -hmm. concept, the other one will tell you, no, no, no. When we use this word ourselves, it means this. The other one said, no, 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 no. In ours, it means this, not that. So they will sort that, and then we'll go to this community testing. And if the community testing is done, then we consider that text having been completed from the side of the translation. We'll check for consistency. But let me warn you. <clears throat> Words have got different meanings in different contexts. They don't mean the same all the time. They mean different things. Is this now in the source languages or in languages all the in languages, general? All the languages. can give you an example in Africans, which all the words are different but mean the same thing. Makom prop for. Makom for. Makom moi fall. Makom yeltemal fall. Yeah. The message you are saying is the same. But you're just using different words. Different words. Do, do you know that if I, I say, God bless you, it can, that Hebrew word, barach, can mean uh, to, to kiss. Kiss. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Curse. curse. For curse. fluke. Sure. Yeah, curse. So the two words, God bless. It's one word. In, one word. in barach. Hebrew. It's barach in yeah. Hebrew. Yeah. If I say, blessed are you, I'll use barach. 
but it can also mean you are cursed. In the same cursed. words, like if I say blessed, I mean you are cursed. So from a translation perspective, Bible translation perspective, yes. you have to look at the context to distinguish whether that is curse or bless, is it? So that's why this is it's, it's a complicated sort of. And the people can even fight. Mm -hmm. Say, no, 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 we must use my concept, not yours. Yeah, because yours is wrong. Or I'm politically of a higher status, so we must use what I say. But, okay, let's go back to that because I find that very interesting. So, we've, the Bible has been already translated in numerous languages. So, there is a, a standard framework that something like that God bless. All the other Bibles have taken to be either a blessing or a curse in this context. Is, is that being um, rethought with every translation or do they kind of fall back on the idea that, okay, it's actually meant as this is the meaning? You know, in most cases, when you want to to make a road wider, the road is already there. That the translation of a Bible has already been translated in other languages. So obviously, when when you are going to translate "cursed," where all the other Bibles have translated "blessed." Obviously, you must ask yourself, there must be something wrong. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so you, you move in almost in the same direction, all of you. Mm. Yeah. Um, you said that the people that you, let's call them recruit, or that the church um, offers uh, to, to, to uh, translate, these are people, normal people from the community. These aren't theologians necessarily, or even, like you said, people that have, might, uh, they have not finished school. Um, the Bible translation, do they then just translate on the face value of what is written there without any theological background or insight and then that gets taken care of later down the process? Uh, you know, you cannot just take anybody. When we are corresponding with the community, I write a letter normally in most all the instances. I said, we need to be having 12 people. Six of them should be women. Six of them should be men. I'm receiving the three positions for the translators. And then, six of them, right from the 12, you understand what I mean? Six of them should be younger than 30 years old. And six of them should be older than 60 years, must be pensioners. That, there's, there's a reason behind that. The 30-year-old ones will be there maybe for, uh, for argument's sake for the next, say, 30 years. Those are the ones who will be reading the Bible. But the, the language is being transmitted by the elderly people. So that for the age is to have this older generation give over this language to this younger generation without the younger generation not understanding what the older generation mm. is saying. Mm. Yeah. And then the whole question of male and female is to balance the sexes. Because men create their own language. And the women have also their own language. And the women are the ones who teach kids how to speak. So you need to have that. Right? Now I'm getting to the next level of dividing the 12. Six must be mother tongue speakers who have got at least a master's degree in their mother tongue language. The others, six, whilst they are Africaners, they must have Greek or Hebrew from the, mother, uh, the master uh, degree level. So now I've got biblical scholars, 
of linguists. You remember in Africans, we, we also have that. And that's what I'm doing in each and every project. But then the other people, so when you come to a community, then they start to say, no, Baloy, we don't have these people. Mm. Yeah, those are the people they are supposed to bring me, like in other project, I've got the grade 12s. Mm. I don't have the PhDs like in Africa, the retired professors, Kumbrings and the Van der Merves and those. Then you try to balance that. Why? <clears throat> As they are busy, as I know Greek and Hebrew and Latin and all these other funny languages, I need to be having someone to control with. Mm. Yeah, if I say there's something wrong and then we are translating, I said no, no, no. Then I get, I'll get to this guy, while someone is busy, a chairperson. We normally, I don't chair meetings. Mm. We normally choose one from the group to chair the meeting. Yeah, I sit with my laptop and I listen. What they are reading, is it reflecting the Hebrew? If I see there's a problem, grammatical problem in Hebrew, then I will go to another one and say, hey, wait a minute. But this is a participle, so this is a verb. Why are we translating like this? Or these are subjects combined together. And then this one will say, no, Baloy, but there's this thing. I said, no, but do you see this thing? Then we start controlling. We said, okay. No, so it means this is the middle road. Mm -hmm. We also have dictionaries and handbooks in paratext. Yeah, so that's how the, ski which, the skills which are needed. Sure. So the, uh, the size of any translation team, that can vary from... How, how big are they on average? Yeah, on, uh, on average, maximum should be 15. 15. Yeah, people. So those 12 I was talking about, plus the three translators, and then plus me. Mm. Yeah, why is the reason for that? We are trying to accommodate all dialects. As I've said, mm. for instance, in the Kung or Kwedam, I can show you these two in my group are speaking this language. These are speaking this dialect. These are speaking this dialect. So that all the dialects are represented. You know why you should do that? If you don't do it, immediately when you have finished the Bible, you might find maybe three quarters of the dialects don't understand what you have translated. And it will be very, very unfortunate to discover it on, when, when you have already printed the text. Yeah. yeah. It's not going to work. So you need to have that right. Translators. You can have as much translators as in normal project five. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be an even number. There should be three or five or seven. So someone to break the tie if they don't do Of the course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when they are even numbered, the two are saying this, the other two are saying this, you have got a deadlock. Hmm. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Just coming back to the four stages, I think you... you yeah. Are there any most? What was the fourth one? Um, community testing. Community. What happens after that? After that, we take it to the layout and design, the Greg people. Yeah. The in design because the software we are using is not public. It's it's not meant for publishing. Mm. Yeah. So they have to design how the Bible is going to look like, like that one. So that's actually that's where the translation team actually officially hands over the translation no. to Bible Society. Or? No, no. You know we are talking like general ignorant general secretaries. Mm. What did they normally say, the secretaries? They said, oh, because Bale, you must sign off this document when you have passed the stage four so that we continue. We used to do that during the uh, Africans and the uh, Isisul. Mm -hmm. I said, guys, the translation work is not finished until the Bible is printed. 
the translators should not be dismissed mm. until the Bible is launched, printed. Why? As these people are shifting these things, you might mess up because you don't understand the language. You are just a layout and designer mm. person. It happened with Africans. Do you still remember? Uh, the Hebrew was mixed up in the introduction. Mm. When I looked at it, my and myself and Prof. Bernard were satisfied the Hebrew was correct. In design, something happened. So the in design read the Hebrew from left to right, mm. instead of printing it from right mm. to left. Mm. And the person who was designing that doesn't know the language. Mm. Needs the translator to say, hey, this is not right. Sometimes you are, to, you are doing, let's take a five series. You need to cut words, poetic words. So the five series, just for our listeners, is a, spe a specific t uh, size of Bible. Yes. Then, what is going to happen is, you won't know where to cut mm. and where to combine words. Mm -hmm. But they are already combined, but because you are working with this electronic thing, it shifts and it put them this way and that way. So you need the translators to help you say, hey, this thing, mm -hmm. it's not right. And when we have taken these samples to, let's take to Amity, mm -hmm. and they print the proofs, mm -hmm. those proofs should go to translators so that the translators can look at it and say, this is correct. Yeah. Why? It's like, it's normal, like yourself. Mm -hmm. If you have got a secretary, you tell the secretary, you dictate it, go and draft this thing and what, what. Who signs that off? It's you, not your secretary. It's the owner of the copy who must sign that and say, this is correct. You get an ad a, a lawyer, draft a testament for me. But who is going to say it's okay? It's not the lawyer, it's yourself. So the translators take total responsibility for that. All the new technology we have, you've actually described to us how it worked these days. How did it work in the past when we didn't have all these nice technologies? Did everybody have to go and live for five years in Cape Town or wherever and to be close to each other to do the translation or how did, how did it happen? Yeah, they have to stay next to each other or send uh, manuscripts to each other. And there was a much, fine, much slower process, I presume. Yeah, much slower. You depend on the post. Yeah. You depend also that the document gets on the other side yeah. in good mm -hmm. order. Someone as was flying the things got lost. Yeah. And then it was a very serious issue. Yeah. yeah, it's similar to when I was at the theological seminary. There was this professor who was very interesting. I won't mention his name, but <laughs> he said when you have written a sermon, what you normally do, you must have it in your head. When the document get lost, you must be in a position to can reproduce it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it, it happened with me when I was doing my master's degree. Mm. I had to, to write on the paper before I, I bought my first laptop. And, and then what happened, and then it gets to my professor. My professor uh, makes some comments there. And then I have to write, rewrite the whole A4. It's not like now with technology where you only change, you put the words in the middle, they shift automatically, all of them. Yeah, you have to rewrite the whole page because that one is red now because of the, the one was marking. Yeah, so that was very, very tough. Total different process. Yeah, t total different. That's why if you, if you normally ask me, how does it take to translate a Bible? Yeah, but humorously, I can tell you, just give me two days. <laughs> you tell me, how is it possible? I said, no, I know the Bible has got 35,000 verses. Sure. It has got one million, around one million words. What I do, I tell you, give me 35,000 people. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> and said, I give each one of them a verse to translate. Tonight. 
That's a very interesting point because if I'm a, a Bible donor off the street, you know, there's a disconnect between here's my hundred rand to translate the word of God, mm. you know. On average, and I know you've said there's over a million words. Yeah. I actually didn't know. I actually didn't know that. A million words, like, wow. Yeah. But just for the the audience sitting and listening, like, how long does a translation process on average take? Is it a couple of years? Is it a couple of months? You've got 15 people working with each other over a series of time. And you also said that it goes from, you, the process should go not just from translation, but to print. Yeah. yeah. So from a, a donor who's like, you know what, I believe in the Word of God. I want to put my money into changing the kingdom of God through translation. What is the expectation level in terms of the process of how long it takes? Uh, you know, it all depends. As I have said, let me start by this simple one that tomorrow I can give you a Bible. 35 verses, you get 35,000 people. You give each one a verse. They translate. Mm. Tomorrow you have got the 35,000 verses. But that was an individual. Mm. It has not been tested in the community. Mm. Right? Can I take that to, the, to be printed? Mm. Of course not. Mm. It's, then you should have this different dialect coming together. There is where it takes longer. And then what, what we normally do from the one million words, I divide them into months. And I divide them into years. So normally on average you are working in terms of around 10 years. An average of 10 years for Genesis up to Revelation. 10 years. Yeah. But then if you... You put your, your foot at the corner there, the accelerator. <laughs> then it can move faster. And it also depends uh, 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 on the quality of the translators mm. and the reviewers. Yeah, what people normally do, they've got lots of talking about uh, irrelevant things. Then what I normally do, I make sure that every day when I'm not here, we're doing a review or test, community testing. We do at least 5,000 words per day. Wow. Yeah, if we have not finished, we work until late in the evening. And then if we finish earlier, we get a bonus. We can knock off earlier. So Monday to Friday, I must make sure I have completed 25,000 words. So for the million, if you divide by 25, then you will have that in 10 years. Sure. Yeah. So you have to manage translation as a project. Yeah, it's, it's like building a house. Mm. You cannot take, you, you need, need to be telling me, no, it's going to take you three months to build this house. So that's how I work. But some other people work differently. Mm. That's why there is the Kosa Bible, 1996. It was started in 1966. It was published in 1996. So it took 30 years. Yeah, there are some other Bibles I can mention. They t take longer. Yeah, and, and, and then that's... But the UBS have already checked how much you can do a day. So with my translators, I said, no, in order to be a translator for this project, you must be able to produce a chapter by day. On average, about 30 verses. But let me say also to you, it's also interesting because <laughs> in the Sivenda project, mm. we said for two days trying to resolve a problem of one verse. Sure. One. We had all the commentaries and all our skills. And we were wondering why. And then when we translated it this way, we looked at the Hebrew and said, no, no, no. This should not be the translation. Mm. And I don't know whether you have realized some Bibles have not translated some verses. Hmm. Not. Yeah. yeah, when you get to the verse, you find it, you, you want to get help from an English translation, you find it's not there. <laughs> so that decision, is it that it's more, it's neg more negative to keep that, or try to keep that, uh, or 
try to keep that verse in and translate it incorrectly versus um, leaving it out completely? Is that then the... the... I, I don't know. Because each and every committee, translation committee or translation project, mm -hmm. you've got people sitting there, infallible, and they don't know everything. Mm -hmm. And then they will try to translate. I can give you an example. For instance, uh, some people would translate and translate like the Africans, guys. When I told them, no, we are finishing this year as we have agreed, they said, no, please give us a chance to, go, to start from Genesis just to go through it, just for a year. When you are at the end, you realize that, no, what you have been doing is not as perfect as you would want it. Because you become wiser and wiser as you continue. Now you would want back to go and revise it mm. before you give it to the... With your new understanding. Of with your new understanding, because now we have gone through the whole Bible, now we understand it better. I had professors who said, no, we have, I have been teaching this for decades. But now, because I'm involved in the translation, I understand it better. I don't want to mention names. Yeah, and 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 the impact when when you are starting here, you refer to that. That was very interesting. We asked it. you. Yeah, the interesting part is now, you don't do translation and come out unchanged. Mm -hmm. No. You either you, you if if you are translating, and you said, but I understood this verse to be meaning this. Mm -hmm. Now I'm understanding it to be meaning this. So what must I do? At the Fort Reger Monument, there was one professor who came to me and said, no, but there's something I, I did wrong, but now can I tell you the right thing? So the person confessed, unfortunately, I'm not a priest to forgive him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So even myself, when I'm reading it in Shivenda, and the next week I'm reading the same text in Sitosa. And then I said, huh? I think we made a mess in the Shivenda text. This is what this thing should be meaning. Yeah. You know, last night I was wrestling with uh, the, the Hebrew word Adam, which is translated humankind, man, or the Adam, personal name. And I was asking myself, does the word Ezekiel have a definite article? Because Adam has got a definite article. Sometimes he doesn't have. Okay. Then I was studying. I said, no, but this is really funny. And then in Hebrew, you, you find two uh, subjects combined, Ben and Peter, right? And then they use a singular verb. Huh? It's funny. And now you have a singular, John, and then here you have a group of people. And the verb in the Hebrew is singular. Do you include the, the plural or do you exclude the plural? Yeah, so each time you read a specific verse, you get this wow. Yeah. I think just for, sorry, we also have much time. The... One question, uh, being a recipient of your many um, conversations and lectures, I find it fascinating because there's something about you that has to be changed because it's different cultures in the melting pot of South Africa. My question is, given where we are as a country and the nature of translation, what is the, what is the, what, the two, maybe one challenges facing translation in our current context as a country? Because we are an organization that serves our current context in our country. So from your lens what, and regarding translation, what are the challenges? If, if you do translation, you are a person. Obviously, when you are young, you are thinking differently. When you are old, you think differently. When, when during the apartheid government, do you know there was a word bastard in the Bible? And there's, in the Sichuana Bible, there was a mukhalakhadi in Corinthians, which made people to be very angry. During that time of the Robert Moffat and what mukhalakhadi translation was the right one. Yeah. And then in, 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 in the Africans, as we said, the bastards, Salni and the Konen Krei van God and Kumni. 
wat gebore buiten echtelijke wat wat nee? but you cannot say it now in 2023 obviously not because you say so what's a bastard is it a child between a black uh, someone and a white someone yeah. and someone was saying I was in the free state someone was saying no we are all bastard I said why is a white person I said no my mother is a Greek my father is an African so my bastard mm-hmm. yeah and and that is from the ordinary level but if you are good get to academic level you will read of post-colonial Bible translation wow. yeah and the colonial Bible translation or the missionary Bible translation or the post missionary Bible translation yeah so But to be safe in most cases, you need to be translating. There are lots of theories which they taught me, free state and whatever, translation theories in the UBS. But what's very funny <coughs> is there is no theory so far which can translate Genesis 1 up to Revelation consistently. Let me give you an example. If I say in English, my pen is in my hand i can translate word for word in africans my pen is in my hand there's no mistake there then you say okay go and translate everything formally like this and then i tell you i say okay all the best of good luck translate into africans what are you going to say ale best and what it's not going to work yeah So some people will say okay what is dynamic equivalency of this what does it actually mean in a certain language another in- interesting thing is body parts there are idiomatic expressions in the bible you will find in one language it's using mind my mind tells me whatever you go to another language you know my two hearts one heart tells me this and the other one tells me that and if you are going to translate because it's in the in the hebrew there is mind you go and translate mind into sitwana then it becomes a funny idiomatic expression mm. so you need to be which, which which loses all meaning for for the readers then yes so it means something different it's like for instance there's this pharisee and the, the um this the text collector were praying in mm. praying in the church or in a synagogue or whatever so as they were busy praying this other one said no the bible says he was beating his in my language if i'm going to translate no i'm beating my ear i'm beating my breast when i feel i'm going to destroy you we are fighting mm. yes so one one physical gesture in what one culture is means is, something different is um, yeah regret or, or repentance yeah but in your culture it can be really for for battle it's a anger or a, a, a okay. uh, yeah a challenge yeah i heard it once someone was saying when you don't do this to chinese when you do this you say go to hell so when you're waving your hand in the air yes sure. but in in most cultures when you are doing that bye bye mm. and you are happy So one gesture in one language can mean something different. Yeah. And very difficult if you don't have mother tongue speakers in that specific project then you have got problems. Um Masunyani you mentioned the Kunan and the, the Kwedam translations. Um I know they are two of the Bible translations projects that the Bible Society is currently with uh, busy with. Can you elaborate a bit more on those two as well as the any other projects that we are currently busy with of course we have got four translation projects running first new translation project mm. those those languages do not have a bible mm. it's kum kwedam these two are in kimberley in platfonte mm, the northern province of south africa yeah and then we have got kilubedi it's in lipompo mm-hmm. Mujaji Sluf. 
the formerly devil's truth. <laughs> Sounds like a do near the Bible there. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, no, I, I can tell you a very interesting story about this devil's truth thing. And then you have got Chitlangan. Chitlangano is in a Kenhook in Bushpark Ridge mm -hmm. in the Mpumalanga province. So these are the projects we are busy with. And quite interesting, uh, Kung and the Kwedam, each one of them has got six dialects. Sure. Whoa. Yeah. And they are, they're fairly small communities within South Africa. Uh, of perhaps. course. Yeah. So it's a, it is considered a minority language in our country. Because the other group is 12, uh, 2,000, the other one is 4. Sure. And a very interesting, the one with 2,000, they've got 20 chiefs. I don't know how they are ruling each other, how many you rule is one. Yeah, so they are minority. So we have got almost uh, 6,000, two of the other one, four of the other one, in Platfontein. They are all in the mm -hmm. same area. Are they basically neighbors in the same? Yes, of course. You can't even see the boundary, and they attend the same school. The radio station is the same, K KXF. Yeah. And yet they are two very different languages. Of course. If you get there and the, your ears are not good enough, you will think they is the same. But after listening very carefully, you realize now they are very far from each other. But it's different dialects. No. Not at all. Those are different languages. They're totally different languages. They are total different. But each one has got six dialects. So when you translate the Bible with all the dialects, at the end of the day, you don't want the Bible verses or paragraphs or books to sound like one dialect and the next like another. Of course. So at the end, you make a mix-up of things. You create another new dialect. <laughs> and a new language almost. Yeah, Something that everybody can understand. Yes. It's the same with Africans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have, we have created and standardized yeah. a certain type of African. And that's the sorry, that's the role in language development. Yeah. 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 We've just celebrated 90 years of the Afrikaans Bible. So I think a word like Hudertirenate that was used, that was actually something that was created by the translators of that Bible. So in that respect, the Bible actually teaches then the this new dialect, if you will, to all the yeah. other people to kind of standardize it. Yeah. Okay. So that's how you how you you try you to overcome, overcome yeah, the bridge with this the diversity dialects. in dialects. Um, Kun and Kweda, it, it's also, um, we, we touched on language development. It is a, a language because many of them actually speak Afrikaans in their day-to-day -day language. Um, so in this sense, the translating the Bible in those two languages is actually helping the, their language to, um, to continue because it's a, like you said, we're going to standardize the language, but then there's also a, um, a document that, that the the younger generation can can read and, and learn to read and write from to to ensure the continuation of that language. Mm -hmm. How often does Bible translation play that role in minority languages? Yeah, it, uh, it, it just look at the Africans. When this some of your our grand grand great grandfathers came, there were few. And they were reading this Staten Vertaling or the King James. And then when they arrived there, they mixed with other people, Malaysia and uh, whatever. And then they started saying, no, 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 we need our Africans. When you look at the older Bible, it's very funny. They write D-I-D. Mm. And then now we are writing D-I-E. D. -I -E, D. And then you, you go to Caps. Caps is saying stat instead of start. Gefarlek. They say gefarlek. Now they are throwing away. And now when we're busy with these Africans, we're adding something. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you referred to Hudentiren, um, I wanted to refer to Velchelech Saleh mm. in Matthew chapter 5. You will find now we have taken the Velchelech Saleh. Now it's a concept which is difficult in the Greek to, to render. What do you do? Now you try to say, okay, 
Are you happy? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's well. Yeah, chalek, yes, salek. Then you combine the three words in order to create a concept. Okay, so mm. you got three emotions into one word. Yeah, wow. three emotions because you feel when when you don't have that, you did not cover everything. You see, so you create terminologies new, and then you create orthography. You bring dialects to come to one dialect. Understand what I mean? Mm. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, you say, this is standard Africans. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I don't know when, when we are going to, to change under, A-N-D-E-R, to under. Under, to double N, yeah. The way, yeah. You, the way you say it. Mm. Yeah, the way you say it. And, and that's the thing. That's why many people ask, you know, okay, once you have a Bible in a certain language, why do you need it? the second third fourth one i mean like in afrikaans we've got a handful of bibles but that's the thing with language and culture it's continuously changing uh, and the way people speak changes so if 30 years from now the afrikaans that they will be speaking will most likely be different than the afrikaans that was spoken in 1933 so that bible could for all intents purposes not even be understandable i think that's something that's now um, that was the reason behind the, the latest zulu translation is that correct Yes, for, for, for instance, if I say, how are you? If you answer me correctly, you're going to say, I'm, I'm fine. But how do you hear people answering, I'm good? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Huh? What, what, what do you mean? And that's the language we speak. Right? Mm. And then we say in Afrikaans, Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's my place here. And then those who like their English is that the pleasure is mine. Huh? Mm. What, what, what are you saying? Yeah. So all people tend to be speaking that way. So the, as, as they are changing that and we tend to take that to be normal, so all of us are going to speak like that. And then when you go and open the Bible, look at it, oh, this is Shakespeare. <laughs> Much ado about nothing. <laughs> huh? Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. So <laughs> it's, 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 it's changing. Yeah. So that's why you need to be translating the Bible, revising the Bible, or translating a new Bible for people to understand. Hmm. Master John, it's been an absolute pleasure. It was so interesting talking about this topic, and we'll definitely be having you back for more because it is such mm -hmm. a broad topic. Absolutely. We want to delve in more on the projects. Um, I know you've got a lot to say about that, but we are a bit pressed for time given load shedding. It kicks in at 12. So thank you very much for joining us today. It's, like I said, I really it was a really insightful conversation. My colleagues, Anu, Nicholas, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to uh, speaking to you again. You have been listening to the Wired on the Word podcast brought to you by the Bible Society of South Africa.